Good morning, good morning. I'll just give you a second to have a look at that lovely lawn. I mowed that yesterday. Took me an hour and a half. Oh, how are you? <clears throat> I'm early, so I'm gonna go the slow route today. The scenic route. We had thunderstorms last night. I'll let you have a look at my lovely flowers in my front garden. Look at that. Look at that. Oh. And the hyacinth on the wall. And that yew tree, which is a bit of a problem. Traffic management. I don't like you, traffic management. Oh, you're kidding me. Hang on, I'll be right back. Right, I'm back and we're going the other way. The road's closed. So it's quite often closed that road. And people are putting a uh, cable in or they're always mucking about doing something up there. So here we go. Anyway, you were just telling me how well you are, blah, 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 all the usual, all the usual. So, <coughs> I've got a, we've had a pretty a bad run of uh, patients who've presented uh, management problems lately. To the point where I'm starting to think that I, it, either I'm going mad or the patients are. Because I'll give you the latest example. Lady came in seven years ago, right? told me that her dentist had told her that she, she was going to lose her upper left central uh, and that she needs um, uh, an implant and this was at the time where everybody everybody who came in who had a cervical cavity was being told that they needed an implant so anyway she didn't couldn't afford didn't want an implant and I looked at this tooth and you know sure enough it was with a bit of finagling it, it, it was suitable for a post crown so I said to her yeah you know I can do a post crown on that in the way that you know you're overconfident always say yeah of course I can do I can do what that other dentist can't do but anyway but we did we did her a post crown on the upper left one and Johnny Nice it was as well anyway then we didn't see her again for seven years because obviously she'd only come to consult us because she wanted us to do something that no other dentist could do and she came in with a for a checkup and after seven years obviously she pays 78 quid or whatever our ad hoc examination fee is for someone who you know only comes then when they feel like it and um, She said to the receptionist, the receptionist said to her that, or, or, or she said to the receptionist, yes, but I'll, I'll, I'll be, I don't mind whatever it costs to get it fixed, I'll pay to get it fixed. So the receptionist uh, uh, put her in, and then it turns out that she's got a Maryland bridge, a cantilever Maryland bridge, so it's a two cantilevered off a of three, upper left, right? So she's got the upper left one is my post ground, and the upper left two is missing and it's been replaced by a Maryland bridge counted off a wing cantilevered off a wing on the on the three except that's fallen off hasn't it so <clears throat> anyway I looked at the um, <clears throat> upper left central and there's a big lump of something on the inside I'll keep talking but you won't have my full attention. So I thought that's, she said, the crown had fallen out and that what the history of the crown was, the crown had fallen out and she'd been to her NHS dentist who'd stuck it in. <clears throat> but it had fallen out again. 
So she then back to her NHS dentist who stuck it in, but it had fallen out again. <coughs> so she then said to the dentist, this is no good. And I said, and, and the dentist said, look, if you want this to stay in, <coughs> you're gonna have to buy some, some proper glue, some decent glue, because I've got no, I haven't got any proper glue. So what she did was she went out and she sourced herself some crown and bridge glue and uh, stuck the central back in. And what's the reason why the crown keeps falling out is because the roots split. The uh, and so that big lump of something I could see on the platel was actually the half of the root, the palatal half of the root, where it had been displaced palately where she's rammed this post ground back in with all the glue. So, anyway, the point was that she wanted this, now she now wants this Maryland bridge stuck back in. But the problem was I, could, I couldn't get it to go back in properly because she hadn't put the crown back in the same place that I had cemented it seven years ago. So I said to her, I'm gonna have to, you know, fiddle about with this Maryland bridge to get it fitted. So to which she's like, all right. So anyway, I, I shaved the front edge of the um, two down a bit and uh, did the whole thing, uh, cleaned, debonded, uh, reconditioned the Maryland Bridge. I'll try and speed this up. Uh, reconditioned the Maryland Bridge, uh, re-edged it, re-bonded re, uh, it, etc took all the crap glue off the inside of her three, uh, re-etched it, re-bonded it, and re-cemented it. The reason why she'd come to me to have the um, Maryland Bridge stuck back on was because her NHS dentist told her that it needed a metal primer glue, uh, in other words, a Panavia type glue, which again, they don't have. So, in fact, I'm not even sure that she's, um, She's telling me the whole correct order of things because this, it did look very much like someone had tried to stick this composite bridge back on with um, just ordinary uh, crown of bridge glue, you know, white glue. So, anyway, uh, she, um, so we got it stuck back on and everything and, it, and the whole point was she needed it doing within two days because she's got a, she's got some sort of social event coming up tomorrow and didn't want to be walking around without a front tooth. So we fit her in at short notice, got her problem solved. Then she went through to the reception and said that she got no money to pay to have the bridge re-cemented, uh, the 78 pounds for a checkup and examination and report was was all she's got, all she had in her bank account. And she she thought that would include um, the re-cementation of the bridge you know, which is which is precisely not what she told the receptionist. She said that she was happy to pay, unless unless you know. But you never know with these third-party conversations. She may have said, "Well, she's she's happy to pay the 78 on the basis that it was assumed they included whatever treatment was necessary at that appointment." So, so <clears throat> the receptionist was pretty gutted about this because. She thought it was her fault that um, uh, she hadn't she hadn't got the money, and I said, in fact, no, it's not. It's my fault that you haven't got the money, because I should have said to her, I can stick this back in for you, but it's going to cost her a hundred quid or whatever. And then, then she could have had the argument with me, couldn't she? Instead of the argument with the receptionist, because uh, patients feel far happier arguing with a receptionist than they do with the dentist. So really, this is a conversation that they need to have with you and not, not with the receptionist who's just like, oh no, I've just been told to charge you, blah, blah, blah. So so that was my fault. And basically the reason why uh, I had not told her that there'd be an additional charge for sticking in the bridge is because, first of all, um, there are some misconceptions that I wouldn't say patients uh, necessarily believe, but they certainly take advantage of 
which is one that, um, oh, I thought that what I paid was going to cover everything. You know, the, the examination covers the whole course of treatment type argument. Um, you know, I thought that was included. I thought that was included. And then there's so so you have to tell people in advance how much it's going to cost. And in fact, sometimes I've even gone to the point of saying, "Look, you know, while I just go and uh, recondition your bridge, pop into the reception and sort the money out, and then when we stick it in, you can get straight off." You know. And the other thing was that um, not only did I assume that she would realise or admit that any treatment necessary, in the, uh, you know, as a result of the checkup, would be in addition. I thought, and I still think that what we charge to do all that work, you know, examination, diagnose, um, treatment plan, recondition, refurbish, re-etch, re rebond, etc. For for what we charge is reasonable. I think it's a reasonable fee. Now the law on fees being reasonable states that where no fee is agreed in advance that the court will uphold a fee if it's a reasonable fee for the work so contract law basically revolves around three things that's offer of a contract to do something uh, acceptance of the contract to do something and an agreement on the cost and the cost in legal terms is called the consideration. So uh, you pay a consideration in respect. It doesn't have to be money, it could be anything. Uh, but, but that's it, it's I offering to do something, you say yes, you want to have it done, we agree on a price, that's a contract. You don't have to shake hands on it, that's, that's a contract. So in the case where there's no consideration is agreed, so where someone offers to do something for someone else and they agree but they don't discuss the price then should it go to court the court will say well what's a reasonable price for that work and I think for 100 quid or so what we charge I think that is quite a reasonable price for that amount of work bearing in mind that she had it done at less than 24 hours notice it was an urgent job she needed it doing within two days and you know we we do have to buy and stock the um, the glue that her other dentist doesn't buy and stock in order to be able to do these jobs. So I thought, well, uh, she's going to go outside, pay her money, and say thank you very much for getting me fixed up at such short notice. Well, I didn't think that she was going to go outside and say, oh my God, I can't believe you're telling me I've got to pay another hundred pounds. I just don't have that in my bank account. So, and that's my fault because the issue of cost should never come as a surprise to anyone. And that's part of our philosophy from start to finish. Uh, we always discuss cost in advance. All our fees are on our website. Um, we, uh, before we start anything, we send everybody a cost in treatment plan. And, uh, and if we're gonna do anything or if the treatment plan changes for any reason, then we stop. We explain why it's changed and what's changed, what the new cost is, and get the patient's agreement before we carry on. So basically we down tools. And we don't pick up tools until we've come up with another plan. And that sort of philosophy has worked very well, but the um, you know what you have to do is you've, it, it served us very well, and that's why we stick to it. And, and what happens when we don't stick to it is when you get situations like we had with the patient with us doing the work and basically not getting paid. Now, part of the problem is, of course, that this woman is, uh, you know, was in her 70s, you know, which is not, she's not that much older than me now. And, uh, but she it comes from a generation where 100 pounds was probably their mortgage payment. And so for her just to be told, uh, let's have 100 pounds, thanks very much is uh, a major problem for them. And I mean, it's a major problem for a lot of people in this country. There's, you know, we're in a situation now where taxes are the highest they've ever been in living memory. And inflation is uh, 
it means that prices are consumer money supply inflation means that consumer price inflation is shooting up and lots of people are struggling you know they're finding they can't uh, they need to have stuff done and they can't afford to have that stuff done you know it's like you know you know your lawn needs mowing but you've got a petrol mower and you can't afford to buy petrol to put in the petrol mower to mow the lawn you literally don't have that money and you don't have that you don't have a chance to get any more money you can't work any more hours because perhaps you don't work you're on a pension <coughs> or you're living on the income from your investments or whatever and and you just there's no potential for you to this is why you see old people turning up at b and q and places like that because they just need more money uh, either that or you've just got to downsize you know so uh, so she's got all this advanced crown and bridge work um, which patients always used to have you know 20 30 years ago it's quite common to see NHS patients with a lot of lot of crown and bridge work because Jimmy Steele put a stop to all that being a consultant in the restorative dentistry and issuing the Steele report really with the premise that um, that they don't you know that that technically advanced work is wasted on on the NHS patients which I think you know to be honest for the most part it is you know I mean I've got a lot of patients who probably could have some technically advanced work if only they would brush their teeth but they just don't ever brush their teeth and so they never get the technically advanced work you know which is how it should be you know I was told at dental school that patients have to deserve crowns and bridges they don't they're not have an automatic entitlement to them they have to show that they are the right sort of patient to to have this sort of work. Um, of course, when you're private, it doesn't matter. You know, you can pay for what you like. If it fails, and it comes out of your pocket. But if it comes out of the taxpayer's pocket, it's not fair for the taxpayer to have to subsidise something which is the work for which the prognosis is very poor. So anyway, she went away highly unhappy. A classic case of how you can book someone in, give them all the service, do exactly what they want, see them at, at less than 24 hours notice for, uh, whereas where her NHS dentist obviously couldn't. I mean, I can't believe this NHS dentist has stuck this crown in twice, it fell out and then said she needed stronger glue. I mean, this is a classic case of a split root, right? If you, um, if a crown falls out, a post crown, and you cannot find, you cannot work out why it's fallen out, you know, it's got a 10 millimeter parallel sided <coughs> para post or some cast post in it. And it's fallen out and it's been in there a few years and there's nothing wrong with the bite and it's just fallen out. Then there's one or two reasons. Either there's an infection at the tip of the root because the infection can not only dissolve the bone, can dissolve the glue on the post and make the post fall out. But far more likely it's that they're, they're, the root is split. Now, the causes of uh, split roots are usually short posts and conical shaped posts. If you've got a long parallel post, which is the one we always use, uh, it's much less likely, but it's certainly not impossible. And certainly I'm not gonna make any comment on what's happened to this tooth in the seven years that I haven't seen it you know this I'm not going to beat myself up against about the fact that the post split um, she may have been hit in the face by a dog she may have been trying to eat on it without the um, you know Maryland Bridge has fallen off etc etc so all of this all of this analysis right out of one probably 30 minute visit this is the sort of stress that we're under <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I've got my lungs full of um, grass pollen. Go on, you can have a go. Go on. There's a long line of cars waiting there. Usually you find it's because it's one timid person at the front <clears throat> who just literally won't go under any circumstances. Oh, hello. <clears throat> Someone's in trouble. 
yeah so <clears throat> so there she is she's gone away she's had her bridge stuck back in she's all right for a social event she's had it done free of charge and yet she's still gone away really really cross and not only that she's made us really cross as well because what she's done is is unreasonable you know she's only she's using us to get her to do things that our NHS dentist can't or won't do and she only pops in to see us once every seven years and so as a result and quite correctly in my opinion we have put a note that she's not to be offered any further appointments and that's not not because she hasn't got any money or anything it's because she's abusing the system She's abusing us. She's abusing our. Uh, she's abusing our system. And uh, anyway, but so we had a little staff meeting on that, which is I always, um, you know, it always makes me laugh when the CQC say, "Can we have all the minutes of your staff meetings?" You know. <clears throat> We, we had a staff meeting literally as soon as she walked out the door and we finished one the services down said right we need to have a quick staff meeting about that but you know i don't want you to feel guilty i take full responsibility i should have told her there was a cost associated with sticking the bridge in she should have said she can't afford it and when we could have sent her back to her nhs dentist but i think the moral of the story is right if you're going to see a private dentist and I've learned this out from my experience with my private dentist. You're going to expect to have to pay about £300 every time you go. And, and every time you go, let's say your appointment's going to be about an hour long. And you're going to expect to pay about 300 quid. All right? The days when you could go to a private dentist. I mean, people come to see me for a checkup, And if they're regular, if they're regulars, they only pay 35 quid. But if you're coming for treatment, like a crown or something, then um, then about 300 is what you need to budget. And if it's less than that, you're doing well. <sighs> anyway, we've made a few we've made a few adjustments to our website because we had this one one lady the other day who. We made a checkup appointment and then she was very rude over the phone. So we cancelled her checkup. And she said that, um, you know, having been offered a, a, an appointment for a checkup, she considered herself to have been accepted for treatment. And she said, there's nowhere on your website that says once you've got a, a checkup appointment that you're not, you might not be accepted for treatment. So what, what did we do? Because we're very small and we're very slim and we can pivot quickly. Within 24 hours, we had a thing on our website that said acceptance for an examination does not imply acceptance for treatment. And then, and then the other thing I've added now is that um, uh, examination fees do not include treatment fees. You know, I mean, I think we need to make this more clear. The problem is you, you don't have to make it clear for the average person. You have to make it clear enough for the most stupid person. Okay, so... That's why we've had to put these things on. And it pains me to put them on. But then on the other hand, I do understand why patients don't appreciate that acceptance for an examination is not acceptance as a patient of the practice. They, we, we understand that. We know how that works. We have a look at you. If we like it, then we, we take you on. If we don't, we, we don't have to. And we don't have to give a reason why we don't have to either. But um, for a patient, it's, not, it's all the same thing. You know, they just, it's all blurred together. And it's the same when we say, <clears throat> especially because we charge in advance, um, you know, and, and we don't always do what we've charged for. So we reserve the right to um, change, the, to, to increase or even decrease the charge if we've done more or less than anticipated. And again, the patients, you know, shouldn't be allowed to come in and say, well, I've paid my checkup charge. And, and I told you when I booked my checkup that I had a bridge falling off. And so, um, you know, I assume that you charge me for everything. Um, and so I'm not paying any more. So, all right, so it's a shame. She slipped through the cracks. She shouldn't have done, but she did. 
but it's been a lesson to us all. And hopefully now that was a lesson to you. Okay, all right, nice to talk to you, bye.